Welcome to the Eye of Power podcast. I'm your host, Tom Dardick. But this podcast is not about me. It's about you and your power. It's time to claim yours. Adam Lawrence and I have been uh, friends and professional colleagues for a number of years now, and I've been able to see how he's been able to help our organizations through efficiencies, through finding uh, way better ways to do things, uh, even mundane things that you know would have seemed obvious in retrospect, but nobody actually took the time to change. And he has a process that he has a book about. It's called The Wheel of, of Sustainability that uh, you'll be able to look at uh, uh, through a link on on the website here. Uh, but uh, And I do recommend it for anybody who's on a team, anybody who has got a team they're responsible for as a way to um, consider, hey, process improving, you know, getting a little bit better than we are today. There's no telling what you might find. And of course, we none of us know know what we don't know. And we all have blind spots. And and I think it's that humility of understanding that, wait a minute, I should be in the business of finding out what I don't know on an ongoing basis that brings us to get the kind of help from people such as Adam. So I'm looking forward to this discussion with Adam. Uh, I think that uh, you'd be able to see how well thought out it's, his system is really born of lots of experience over very, very many years, very, very many uh, installations and experiences of working with with client teams and uh, hope you enjoy it. And you'll s- hopefully see how uh, working with teams and, and in leadership roles, it all really does come down to uh, taking ownership, responsibility, uh, our own agency, looking in the mirror, being able to take make those changes. And that's what, of course, we're all about at the eye of power. So uh, I'd like to welcome Adam. One of the things that uh, I've been thinking about in preparing for this interview is, you know, how we're kindred spirits, Adam. I mean, you know, we both have uh, spent a lot of time in our industries. We both have built models. Uh, We both want to share those models to help people. So, you know, we're kind of coming from a similar playbook there. Uh, Your system is called the wheel of sustainability. Um, can you briefly walk us through what that is and how it helps people uh, achieve the aims they're looking to achieve? Yeah, well, great question, Tom. So the issue that I run into, so I'm a consultant that helps teams solve critical business problems. And the hope is that once the problem is solved, it stays solved. So mm-hmm. what I noticed early on in my career was we would solve a problem, a team would be excited, we'd go away, three months later, the problem would come back. So my challenge was to come up with a system to keep the problem solved that was easily transferable, trainable, and we could actually implement during the one week long continuous improvement or Kaizen event. Okay. So Kaizen is a Japanese word. Can I just interrupt for a second there? Cause I'm wondering about yes. like, so, so the model helps them sort of remember, stay aware, top of mind to what they agreed, that sort of thing, or um, I guess I'm wondering how do people sort of drift? What are some of the traps or the things that bring them off track? Yeah, so the the key to the model is leadership commitment. So what happens is the team does a really great job putting blood, sweat, and tears into a solution to a problem. They've implemented new standard work, operating procedures, visuals, and so on. And if we have an engaged the leadership team as well as the rest of the organization around those changes, we make assumptions that they understand it and they're going to follow the new standards. And this is a bad assumption. As you know, assumption is always a bad word to use anyway, right? <laughs> so, so what I learned was we can't make those assumptions and we've got to make it simple, visual, and s- easy to manage the whole system so that people will see the change as the better thing. Because wow. most of us know that Human nature is expect the worst and hope for the best. So change is typically a negative experience 
at least mentally for people. And what I'm trying to do is change that into a positive experience by applying this system called the wheel of sustainability to any changes that we do make. And it has nine elements to it when you're ready. So think about an image of a wagon wheel. So I live in Amish country, not far from you, of course. And so the wagon wheel in the center is this thing called leadership commitment. So what we're saying is, how do we set up the team for success so that any change they make, they feel authorized and empowered to do so? So what I do is I coach leadership in what that looks like and how they have to participate or play. The first piece of that is how we actually charter or scope out the work that we're going to engage the team in. I help them understand what the team would look like and then what is their role in supporting the team as the activities occur. These things tend to be in one week or shorter duration events. And so they have to show up the first thing to kick off the team. They have to come to the team dinner. They have to approve no matter what the team says they want to do. You know, they he, he or she has to realize that I'm going to keep them within the scope. We're not going to spend a million dollars. We have a week. We can't do that anyway. Uh, and that we're going, so essentially it's blanket approval to do and to do any of the changes that they want to make and then in a, in a way to support those changes. So the other eight elements surround that leadership commitment. So the answer is yes, no matter the question is the easiest image to give leadership around that. There's nothing more important going on in your business, your facility, your location, your office, whatever. So you have to act that way. Drop what you're doing when they need your help, encourage them, inspire them, support them, and even roll up your sleeves if you have opportunity to do so. So I've seen leaders do that. So I share that. I explain that explain what their level of commitment needs to be, what the team's commitment. So that's leadership commitment. Now surrounding that, because we don't know what the change is going to be prior to the event, now that we have made a change, we have the first element, which is called notification, meaning that we've made a change. What is it and why did we do it? And what do we think the benefits are of it? So it's the message of the change in a way that is beneficial and truly transparent to the organization. Now, notification is the first one. And so think of it as a wheel at 12 o'clock is notification. So that's the first thing. What is the message around the change? Why does it matter? Why did you do it this way? The next element, so that's typically in front of a group. The next element is called training and review. So we're going to do this one-on-one -on -one now. So I am going to explain to you specifically, Tom, what the change is, why we made the change, I'm going to let you ask questions and I'm going to demonstrate it for you. So I'm going to take the time and show my caring for you that I will take time with you to demonstrate it. I'm going to do it in front of you, giving you the opportunity to ask questions. It's going to be just you and I, so you don't have to worry about peer pressure. Now, I'll ask you, hey, did you understand that? Any questions? The typical answer is no, I have no questions, but that's not actually true. So I can either dig deeper to, to because I'm looking at your body language when I'm demonstrating, but then the next element is to have you demonstrate it to me. So now I have you show me that you actually do understand. So now I can correct any in, in inaccuracies, any behavior, any safety risk, anything at all in the moment just with you to make sure you truly do understand it. So that's training and review. The next element is called uh, visible evidence, which means that from 20 feet away, you can tell if somebody's actually following the change as designed or not, and if okay. they need help or not. Because so not all if changes you, are created equal. So you, they, they have to be evident cherry change that are obvious. Correct. So large signage, red light versus green light, uh, shadow boarding so that the tool is sitting in the right place. I can see that the document is where it's supposed to be. The light is flashing green, which means everything's good. So that way, if leaders see somebody following the change as prescribed, they can step in and and thank and recognize. If they see somebody not following the change as prescribed, they can step in, coach, and help. So remember, the leadership commitment is tied to all of this. So leaders have to be ready to not walk by, but actually look at the visual, make sure the person is following this new standard and reinforce it and encourage it. 
The next so one this, is, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to ask a follow-up on that because yeah, absolutely. that strikes me on the, on the part of the leader as a skill and a habit, both right. Where I can, right. I need to dial into what am I looking for? And I also have to have the discipline to do it enough in the beginning so that it gets into muscle memory. And then I just keep doing it or, or am I raw off on that? Or how, how, how do you think along the lines in terms of the perspective of the, the leader? So the visual, so you're right about the leader, the behavior, we have to, we have to prep them to, to engage, but the visual has to be so easy and so obvious that it's hard to miss it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So think of yourself going to the mall and parking in a parking space, right? About 30 feet away, you can tell if the space you want to park in is safe to park in because somebody hasn't crossed over the line or they're too close to the line, and maybe I'll pick another space, right? right That's the right. same idea. So large visuals, big flashing green or red, uh, Okay. the things in the box or it isn't in the box. So it's really obvious. So the team is always challenged to do it in a way that, hey, within three seconds, I know if everything's okay or not okay from 20 feet away. That is the challenge for them. So I because I've done this hundreds of times, I have many, many examples that I can share with them in case they're stuck. Color coding, uh, shadowing, um, you know, putting things in boxes or on hooks with things around them in big print, lights, audio signals. There's just so many choices. But what we don't want to do is overdo it. We mm. just want to make it easy to do the right thing and easy to tell if we're doing the right thing. So that's visible evidence. Okay. The next element, the fourth one, is called all tools available. What we're saying is give the person what they need right where they need it without having to search. So in a, in a manufacturing facility, if I need a wrench in three locations, I don't keep wrenches in a toolbox. I hang the wrench at the three specific locations so that I don't have to remember to bring it with me. It's already there waiting for me. I'm also going to label that wrench so that if it's sitting somewhere else where it's not supposed to be, anybody would know where to place it back so that it'll be there ready and available for the person who needs it. The same thing being in your computer. Can you find your files? Do you have all the software you need? Do you have the links that you need to do your job and not have to search for them? So when we're designing these changes, we're making sure that everybody has everything we need. So the leadership commitment comes from the fact that, hey, if I have to go buy some software or buy a tool or buy a new document, the answer is always yes. We're making it easier for somebody to do their job safely and productively. Okay. So okay. those are the physical elements. Now I'm going to take you into the behavioral elements of this. Okay. The next element is what we call clear benefit. So the idea being that the person that is going to have to execute the new standard, but wasn't on the team, has to see it as a benefit to them specifically, or else they're not going to follow it. So right. they need to understand it. They need to be properly trained. They need to get the opportunity to ask the tough questions. And then we always want them to try it. If they don't try it, it's easy to think of the change as bad. If they try it and they see that it's beneficial to them personally, they're more likely to do it. So in a 24-hour operation, you know, at 2 a.m., I'm not going to be there in, at 2 a.m. So the person makes a decision to do it the old way or the new way. Well, of course, we want them to do it the new way. But if they don't see it as their own personal benefit, they're less likely to do it. Okay. So very often in the middle of the week, we have the team go out and talk to people not on the team, demonstrate it, and get their feedback. Because if people still think it's harder, then clearly they're not going to do it. If they right. see, oh my goodness, this is so much better for me. And then in their own words, personalize it. They're more likely to follow the new standard. So we're trying to say, so in the old days, we call that what's in it for me, right? With them, right? right? That's the old timey way to go. So I'm a, I've been doing this for a while, but I liked using a different term just to get that with them out of people's heads. Okay. Right. Now the next element is called layered audits. So the idea now is the person that does the work checks their work. Okay, that's what we're all paid to do. But with less frequency, as we go up levels, we're going to audit to reinforce and ensure that people are doing things the right way. So 
if I'm working in an office and I do certain types of documentation, I'm going to check my work from time to time. Mm. My manager should come and visit with me either on a daily or a weekly basis and randomly audit with, with me, not to me, but with me, one of my bits of work and ensure that I still am following the standard, get my feedback for it, reinforce how important it is. That's the next layer. As you go up to the CEO, that person might audit once every quarter or once every year. So we go in layers and all we're doing is re- we're, it's a two-way learning. We're reinforcing critical work, critical standards, and we're showing how important it is because people are engaging with you. So you're not auditing the same person. You're not auditing the same work. You're not auditing at the same time, but you're auditing with a person. And my team is always encouraged to create a three to five minute audit because most people can give you three to five minutes. You can't have a one hour audit. So you can't say audit everybody and everything. No, pick the three most important things, pick it with one person. The rest of the organization will know that the CEO showed up auditing, right? They're going to know. So this is part of that sustainability kind of thing where it's correct, where it's got to be something that you can do. If it's too much, too much work to just keep the, the, the new procedure going, it's right. not going to be something that people are going to be able to stick to. Is that what I'm hearing from you? That's right. It can't be so complicated that people won't be able to do it. And it can't be so complicated that people can't audit it in three to five minutes. Okay. So. For example, a very simple audit is, hey, is the shovel hanging in the location for the shovel? It either is or it isn't. <laughs> okay. Now, And if it's not, it should be being used. Correct. You're being right. used so it's, or it's in its spot, good. Anything right. else, not good. Yeah. So when it's a not good, all you're doing is going back to the person that isn't using it, but it's next to them and said, hey, Do you understand why we put the shovel back when we're not using it? The point is when you need the shovel, if it's hanging there, now you can have it and never have to search for it. I got a question on that then, because, you know, an an example like that to, you know, at least to me, if I'm sort of a lay person, I'm thinking, well, this seems pretty obvious. I mean, why are we having discussions about this? Right. Because do you remember when your mom told you to, there's a place for everything and everything in its place? (laughs) <laughs> right and yeah, she told and you, you to pick up your clothes off the off the floor so you're probably saying it to your kids right so even with the best of intentions people still miss some of the most obvious things or we don't make it important or as important as it is so think about it this way i had a bunch of welders in one of these events where it took them over two hours to gather their tools so that they could perform work on a line while it was waiting for help. Two hours just to get ready to start. Just to get ready because they couldn't find things. By the end of the week, it took them less than three minutes to gather everything they needed. So the the facility saved one hour and 57 minutes of lost productivity, lost revenue, just because we made it so easy for those welders to find what they needed. They made it easy. They knew where they needed their stuff. So you would say, well, that's obvious but they get in the heat of battle and they don't really think about how critical that is. Now, why does it sustain? Because they won't let the rest of the organization screw it up Ah. because it was so frustrating for them. And after about half a year with all the layered audits and all the other leadership support, they realized, Hey, this is really important to the organization too. And now it's just how they do their jobs and the plant benefits every single day because right. of that. So and that, and, the system and so that, sustained. that efficiency, just in the example you shared, Adam, the uh, the two hours versus the, it's basically just, let's call it two hours of shared law. That would have t- been time lost. Correct. Times every time you have to mobilize that force. Yes. So this is a, re- this is a good that keeps repeating over and over and over. Right. Right. Um, and who knows what that's worth over time. Is that correct? Well, I signed an NDA, so I can't tell you, but I know exactly what it's worth. <laughs> and it is not an insignificant number. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, this is this is money that drops right to their profit statement. I'm thinking that it, it's it, it, what I'm getting from you and, and as you go through your model and as you talk about how it's implemented and used, mm-hmm. it seems to me like we're 
we pay less attention to the small and immediate and repetitive and the things that become sort of neurologically speaking, part of our background. We're not thinking about it because it's familiar. It's already there. We're, we're not devoting our bandwidth to that. Our, our, our attention sort of leaves itself open to the novel. What's the mismatch, right? Yeah. So we te- we can send a, we can create these blind spots as a result. So you're going Absolutely. in and you're helping people see those blind spots. Is, is that a good summary? Uh, can you expand on that? Yeah. I mean, I, I've never really thought about it in that way, but it's very similar thing. So most people, they do their work and they keep their head down and they're just paying attention to what they're responsible for, if you think about it. So what, what these events tend to do is it opens up their perspective on the whole picture right? And and oftentimes, some of the most breakthrough solutions are the simplest ones, mm. right? Just drawing a nice outline around where the wrench needs to be, labeling the wrench so you know exactly where it came from. They could have done that without any outside intervention, but they never realized what the impact might be to the overall system, right? right. So right. this is why people like yourself and myself get brought in because we've had so many shared experiences across so many different industries that we see how people solve problems in a way that the group we're helping may not be aware of, or or they don't feel empowered or engaged. That's why the leadership commitment in the center is so critical, that to give them that opportunity, we are sequestering them. When I run a Kaizen event, let's say it's four and a half days, we'll start Monday morning at 7 a.m., we'll work till five or six every single day, The people on the team who have been very carefully identified will be 100% committed to this work. They have no other work that week. This is all they do. It's like a jury being sequestered. So very few people in this world have had the opportunity to work this way. We're taking them off their jobs. It's the only thing they're going to work on. And so the way we describe it is there's nothing more important in your facility, your office, your business than what we're going to do this week. Now, that's not always true, but sometimes it actually is. So mm-hmm. there are stories of multi-million dollar efforts within a week that I've had the opportunity to be part of. Um, so, so right. So what you're calling the blind spots, I might say the person's got their head down with the blinders on. They're not seeing the whole picture around them. Now, one thing I may or may not have pointed out is every one of these elements gets implemented during that week. Okay. This is not homework. We're designing in the audit, the visualization, the tools, the way we're going to message this, the way we're going to train people. And then, of course, there are two more elements that I have not shared yet. Okay. So let me let me share those last two. And this okay. is kind of the kind of the 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 ribbon or the bow that ties it all together. So the first one is called accountability. Now, this is not personal accountability. This is leadership accountability. And there's some overlap in these elements. So if you or I as a leader are walking to a meeting and we're going to be late, but out of the corner of our eye, we see somebody not following standard, we now make a choice. And our accountability under this model is to be later for the meeting and engage with the person to redirect and correct the behavior in a coaching and positive way. Okay. to help them to redirect them back to standard. So you're okay. moving that, that that sort of guaranteeing the operation of the system, the quality control, the ecology of of the of the of the new system, you're right. moving that up the hierarchy of of uh priorities. Uh, spe- yeah. I suppose that's especially true when it's new, right? When it when yes. Yes. before things get into muscle memory so that right. it, it does take some it takes a kind of a group effort to help each other remember. Is, is that correct? That's absolutely right. And the other thing is we're some pretty creative animals. Humans are creative animals. So sometimes people like to test the new system, <laughs> right? It happens. Hey, are they really serious about this? They're changing stuff all the time. What if I do this? And if somebody swoops in and says, hey, here's why doing it the other way is so much safer and more productive and critical and we need to do it the same way. Now everybody learns, hey, that's not one to test anymore. This They're really serious about this. This is really important. This guy just stopped what he was doing. Now he wasn't yelling at me or she wasn't yelling at me. What they're doing is they're coaching me up. So I'm actually coaching leaders on how to coach this when you see it in real time. Now how they actually react 
you know, I'm not there for all of it, but I've heard stories following it, you know, surprisingly impressive type of stuff. So they, they make it important. The last piece is what I call recognition. And this is about tying cause and effect together. So we did this and because of this, something really good happened. So it's the telling of stories and making of connections. It's not awarding prizes or any of that. So I use recognition in a way that actually a professor told me I was using the wrong word. I said, <laughs> you may be correct, but I'm going to still use it anyway because it got people's attention. It's so, all about- it's, po it's positive right. reinforcement. It sounds like it's catching people right. doing things the sort of the yes. right agreed way. Yes. Uh, using the carrot just as much as you are the stick sort of a, sort of a, right. a thing, right. right? So an example of this is that somebody whose area was helped I've had them explain what we did in their area and how it's been helping him, in his words, with another group. So we're reinforcing it and the credibility grows and his commitment and sustainment of it grows every time he tells a story. So I'm not telling the story anymore. He is. <laughs> right? Isn't that slick? So I've seen that done and I've done that for probably 15 years. The first time I was like, I think I stumbled onto something. And then I started to experiment with that to see if it was really more impactful than somebody just telling the story outside of the team. No, the internal person telling that story and showing people how things work is a lot more impactful than the outside consultant or the CEO or whoever speaking that story. Right. I mean, the effect is something I talk about a lot in the eye of power is the power of story. And yeah. the more that you can put the listener of the story in the hero's place of the story, Absolutely the stronger right. the story is, right? So I think that's a right. that's sort of the principle that you're pointing to there. An internal story is something, okay, this pertains to me. You're removing a layer of sort of distance and I'm more I'm more in that story then, right? So, so that's good. That's actually a pretty good segue um, to... Um, something I was wondering about, learned about this model and all the experiences you've had. And we've known each other quite some time now. So yeah. I've gotten a chance to hear some of these things, but I'm always amazed at at the stories that you kind of <laughs> have from this. And I know some things have to be changed to protect the innocent and all kind yeah. of thing. But yeah, the names uh, always get changed and the money, yeah, so, the numbers get changed, but yes. Right. But but the the lessons stay the same regardless, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely so I right. just I just wanted to see if you had sort of um Maybe a story on the on the bright side that would be inspirational, and possibly a story on sort of the the opposite side of a cautionary tale of tragedy. Uh, you know, as some of the... I got them. <laughs> okay, well let's let's hear those. All right. So one of my favorite stories is of the weld shop. Did this about four and a half years ago with a client. This and I already told you it used to take them two hours to respond. To okay, so this is that, that same same that place, same client, same okay, place. okay, because yeah, I'm I'm actually picturing the person, right? I'm mo my stories. I have a very personal connection with my teams. Think about going on a five day road trip with a bunch of friends, right? right? The first hour, everybody's on their best behavior. By six hours in, every bad habit you get to really know, <laughs> folks. So we're doing this. I get a new team every time. I don't get to pick them. I give I give a general view of what this should look like. So this team was made up of one engineer and six welders. Okay. Okay. Now welders are very proud people. <laughs> They've got high skills. They can do some stuff, but they also, a lot of them don't want to be on teams. Okay. So that's, that's fine. So this weld shop serviced a 900 person factory. Okay. Okay. So again, when I walked through the weld shop prior to the event, it was kind of a disaster, would be a nice way of putting in so much clutter and stuff in the way. And these guys were working their tails off to try to help the factory, but they're all grumpy and grumbly. And, you know, if they just let us do our jobs, you know, we do a lot better. They don't ever listen to us, that kind of stuff. So right. my sponsor says, hey, I got a challenge for you. Help these guys be more productive. <laughs> I'm like, Okay, that sounds fun. Let's do that. So day one, I'm walking into this room and I got seven people glaring at me because we're going to introduce this continuous improvement stuff to them. And, you know, they're welders. They don't need any of that. Right. So so there's a five step process to help them be productive. It's called 5S and I won't bore you with those details. But the first step is to declutter. 
Okay. So people keep stuff. <laughs> Most people keep stuff. And so in this weld shop, there was old equipment that wasn't being used. There were materials that weren't being used. There was scrap stuff and stuff all over the place. So we spent about a day identifying and removing all that stuff. So think about three 20 or 30 yard dumpsters. You know how big that is? You ever seen those monster dumpsters they put out? We filled three of them. Wow. Okay. So that's a lot of stuff, right? Yeah. Okay. So that's the first step. The second step is now that you have the remaining stuff, you know, uh, put it in the best location to use it. So think very purposefully about where is the main work done and then optimize everything to that main space. So they have these two welding tables we brought together. We brought, we brought power, we brought light, we bought air, we bought hydro, everything they needed. We relocated the lighting, everything, and we labeled everything and we cleaned up everything and everything was where it needed to be. We took all the locks off of the equipment because now that, reduce time to make the equipment available, all that kind of stuff. So that was the second step. So they're really into it because this is all physical work, man. They're welders. They don't want, you know, they physical work. That's cool. The third step is what we would call shine, which is making sure that everything that remains is in optimal condition. Mm -hmm. So we actually created dust collection. We, we cleaned up and inspected things. We made sure everything worked. We lubricated equipment. We did all this type of stuff. So those are the first three steps. They're all very physical, mechanical. They were into it. No problem getting buy-in on that part. Not a bit. After we got them started, because they didn't really think they'd be allowed to throw things out. So again, leadership commitment had been built prior to this. Everything had been set. Anything they want to do, we didn't require any approvals. So while we're doing this, we're creating those visuals. We're creating the messaging. We're creating the putting the tools where they need it. The benefits were very, very clear because they were designing it for their work, mm. right? They just had all that opportunity. Now we're going to have to create the audit and the checklist. Okay, they're welders. Ain't no way they want to do that. So I'm going to tone it down. There were a lot of really naughty words said every other sentence when I said, we got to create the audit and the checklist. No way, they said, with other words interspersed, <laughs> <laughs> right? We don't do no stinking checklists. That's right. paperwork. That's for managers. That's for, no, this is for you to make sure that everything is exactly as you need it to be. So going around in a few circles, I was getting nowhere with them. So I decided I need to create a significant emotional event. So I put up a slide showing some other team's checklist and went word by word with them to show them why it was so critical. All the mean, all the while, three of them's faces turned redder than the lettering on your backdrop. Okay. So finally, my leader, my team leader, the lead welder says, Adam, we've had enough of this fill in the blank. We're going to go to the smoke shack and we're going to decide what we want to do. You wait here. And they walk out. And I'm like, okay, that's what I needed to do. I hope they come back. <laughs> so I'm sitting in this room for about 20 minutes. It felt like two hours. It felt like. When, when my sponsor walked by, hey, what'd you do? I hear you. Ticked them off. I said, I sure did. They needed it. <laughs> I said, I hope they come back. He says, they'll come back. I said, are you sure? Because <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> but anyway, 20 minutes go by. They come back. They've got smiles on their faces like they're going to they're gonna put me in my place, basically. And they said, all right, we figured out what we want to do. You type, we'll talk. Uh -huh. I'm like. Cool. So I go up on this checklist and they give me 11 things to check for in their words, in their words, not my words. Very similar to what I had, by the way. But anyway, so that was it. That's a checklist. Okay. Now, who's going to do this checklist? All right. Well, the welders need to do this every day. We'll rotate that. Okay. That's cool. Where are you going to put the checklist? We'll put it right where everybody can see it. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. Now, what do you want management to do? What do you mean? What do we want management to do? Don't you want them to make sure everybody's playing by your rules? Because you're not here all the time. Well, yeah. So I show them a checklist that managers do. It takes three to five minutes, by the way. Very simple. I said, all right. So what you're going to do is you're going to tell the plant manager he has to do that. We are? I said, hell yeah, you are. What do you mean? Why wouldn't you? Is this important? Yes. How much time have you saved? Two hours to three minutes? Yes, three minutes. They probably said three seconds. 
Yeah. I said, well, you tell him that and let him decide if that isn't worth checking every once in a while, right? right. You tell him what you want him to do. So we, they did. Okay. So at the end of the week, they do, we always do a report out where the team tells the staff, the leadership, and actually the CEO ha happened to be in the area that day for a different reason. So he attended. So these guys did one of these reveals. Like, here's what it used to look like. We had all these big pictures because I'd taken a lot of pictures. And then we pulled the curtain back because every weld shop has a big curtain so that you don't get your eyes burn. You know, this right. is not good. And the oohs and the ahs and the clapping when they came in. And now these guys are like so proud and they're showing it off and tell them why they got to do it. And then they wrap it up in the end. And I did not tell them to do this. They said, and here's what we need from our plant manager. And they look right at the plant manager. You can do this, can't you? I won't say <laughs> his name. And what could he say? But of course I will. And for the years since, every single day, the check is done by the welders. And every single week, somebody on the leadership team does the audit without fail. And they are now two new, they, they've rotated, uh, we, we call them area owners. The person that you have to answer to in the weld shop, that person, the first guy, the, the angriest and grumpiest of them all to begin with, has rotated out and there's a new leader and owner and it's just as good or as good as or even better than we left it why because it helps and and leadership supports it to this day because it's so critical to how they perform so, so we'll call that quite, the good the good story yeah, yeah so, so a couple <laughs> couple good lessons from that yeah um you know to, what i take away is is that that accountability function actually is not just a one-way street you, you've got you know the, the leadership requires being willing to be mm -hmm. sort of vulnerable and being held accountable for what you're delivering and what you're willing to you know making sure you, when you say you're going to do something you do it too so part of right. you know that that audit that i and it doesn't necessarily have to be me personally but i have as a leader i have to buy it and and sort of live it is, is that right that is absolutely correct. And so that's the preparation I do with leaders prior to these events to give them a sense for what's about to happen. And and also, I look in the whites of their eyes to see if they're really ready for that, because, yeah, because some are some, not. <laughs> it takes some humility, right? And it's a willingness absolutely. to be vulnerable, willing it, willingness right. to maybe, hey, you know what? I might drop the ball here possibly once or right. twice, and, and it's right. okay. Yeah. Uh, so that, and, that's and they've got to be to called. They've got to be called out. They've got to be willing to be called out because we said there's nothing more important. If it's true that it was nothing more important, then you have to act like there really isn't anything more important. Right. This this must live on. It's that valuable to our people, our customer, our organization. Yeah. So you said so when you're in that in initial stage, Adam, where you're sort of talking with the leadership, you're sort of kind of preparing and getting a read on them is this yes. is this going to work is it, you know where do i have to help here are they ready to just jump into an event or do we have to do some sort of pre-work before we're going to be ready for that is that right that's absolutely right and so that's the hardest lesson for us new business owners the ability to say you know what this probably isn't a good idea even though they're willing to pay me the ability to walk away from business if they are truly not ready because what what i do not want to do is set them up to fail. I have right. to set them up to win. And if the leadership isn't there, even if you have the willing team, it's not going to sustain if you're not. Remember, the leadership commitment's in the center of that wheel. If that goes away, the wheel falls apart. Right. You can lose right. one of the you can lose one of the spokes of the wheel and the wheel's still okay. It's not quite as strong. You lose the center, it's gone. There ain't no wheel. I, that's so crucial. I love that aspect of your model. And, and yeah. for me, the idea there is uh, in, when I'm working with teams, sometimes I can't, you don't know, like with a, with a physical process, you can sort of see things, but with a, with a de per professional development of the team process, mm -hmm. it plays out um, over a pretty long period of time. And it's sure. also it's not clear as to have we um, surmounted a hurdle or not. In other words, somebody might do it 
uh, remember a, or, or, or have a new skill or, or conduct a meeting in a more efficient way or something like that. Um, they might do that once or twice or something like, and then sort of revert back. So these things sort of take, I love that measurement, that aspect and to, to whatever degree you can get it. So it's obvious that the yeah. changes are there. So what I'm driving to the question here is um, when it's not so obvious, when it's not, when, when the changes aren't, um, you know, as clear as, you know, is the tool in the right spot? Yes or no. Mm -hmm. uh, when it's more like, is this person performing to agreed standard on this particular thing? Yes. And we have to track that over weeks, if not months, mm -hmm. what insights or what, what's your thoughts on, on how you might take that approach and apply it to a, a, maybe a wider range or a softer range of, of yep. sorts of situations for change? So the good news is we have applied it in non-physical activities. Okay. So there are many, many ways to do this when you're just saying it's a, so first of all, you're asking yourself, regardless of what the activity is, are they following standard or are they not following standard? So you have to have a way to measure that, right? So are they using the documentation? Are they programming in the correct way? Are they following the steps? So one thing we've done in many locations is create a visual audit of following standard versus not following standard. So I audited four people and three of them were following standard and one was not. That was Monday. On Tuesday, four were following standard and two were not. Okay, now you can visualize what did we do about the two? What were the actions we took? We don't have to name them, but the person auditing actually has an accountability and a, and a commitment to help Again, if they're not following standard, because the goal, if you've really created a better standard, right, a better behavior, a better standard, a better procedure, whatever, what have you, is that everybody would follow it. So the goal is to get to 100% compliance. Okay. okay. So again, I've got hundreds of stories and you probably don't have that much time. So we're not going to go any further on that. But I got hundreds of stories of how we've done it in non-physical processes. Can you think uh, of just you, one sort of uh, example yeah. that would, I mean, you gave me a little bit, I, I, I took that, that, that create visual aids. So you're, you're really yeah. taking uh, to me what I, if I understood correctly, you're, you're taking that, which is not all that tangible and you're making it tangible by, by Absolutely. just saying, okay, look, here is the thing. Yeah. And it's a yes or no. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the simplest way to go about it. So a manager comes down and, and assesses five people in her, in her organization around one standard pick it it can be it can be a physical or a non-physical activity they have a conversation to see if they even understand the standard three of them did not so we create a whiteboard monday tuesday wednesday all the way through sunday and the first thing is audit compliance the second thing is coaching opportunities the third thing is actions to follow up on so we're making that visible mm. So what, what do we care about? What we care about is that people are doing the right thing. And what we also care about is leadership is supporting them to do the right thing. And if you throw it in a computer, you don't have to look at it. If you make it big and visible, everybody looks at it. So you put it in the break room where everybody goes at least once or twice a day, or you put it in the restrooms, or you put it in where the time clock is. So everybody sees it. There's no place to hide. And I can even tell if they've updated it recently, because if it's Wednesday and Monday and Tuesday haven't been filled in, guess what? I know who to go to. Right. And when we do these factory audits, we have pieces of paper sitting in a, in a document holder right in front of the location. And I can tell if they've been auditing every week or if they skipped a week and I can tell who did and who didn't do it. And I can go back to them and say, Hey, what are you slacking for? You told me how important this is. And believe me, this is the way I talk, but this is why, you know, not everybody's ready for this because sure. this is all about being real, being transparent, being humble, being willing to be different for the good of the organization. So I try to make it as comfortable and real. I don't use big words. I try not to use any, you know, technical terms. Every so often I throw one in 
it's not intentional. It just happens because you're around so much stuff. But the point is, we're here to help people. And we're trying to help them do the right thing. And if you understand, just like your eye of power, you're trying to help people navigate hard things that they can't do on their own by reinforcing something that was in their blind spot. You're bringing it into the light for them. I'm bringing things into the light for my folks, but I'm turning the light on so everybody can see it. So there ain't no place right. to hide. So that takes. So um, it seems to me that that uh, when you're making that kind of uh, evaluation of whether the team is ready for this approach or not. Part of it is it seems like you have to have a certain level of of trust in the in the cultural environment, right? Um, to be able to uh, operate at that maturity level where people feel like, no, I can be open, and if I make a mistake, it's not you know a death sentence. It's it's just right. we expect right. people to be people, and the the major, uh, and I, I'd be interested in your view on this, but when I'm going into organizations, I'm what I'm trying to impart to leadership is you've got a couple of major choices. One is tomorrow we're going to be better than we are today. And, and, and you, that's a choice that you have to actively make and, and, and you have to be a steward of that choice uh, because it's an active choice. It's not something that takes care of itself. That's what requires the leadership. So that seems like it's analogous to part of your conversation going in. Is that right? What I'm doing is I'm getting a sense for how they engage with their people and how interested are they really in being better. You said that earlier. We have a choice that we're going to make. Do we really want to be better? By the way, some groups don't. <laughs> they may say they do, but they really don't. Things are okay. Leave me alone. So those don't turn into paid engagements. Because I briefly touched on it earlier, but I was trying to want to get, or I wanted to get an idea of what the cautionary tale might be. And maybe it would be related to that where uh, oh, they yeah. thought they were ready and they really weren't. And it sort of sh maybe exposed something that they didn't want to admit or look at or something. I'm, I'm thinking something along those lines. Do you have anything to share along those lines at all? Well, sure. Adam? Dozens of them. Um, <laughs> so, so I have actually two tales, but I'll do a recent one. And then if we got time, I'll do a, a, an earlier time that told me I needed a wheel of sustainability. <laughs> okay. okay. So that's a different one. Uh, very recently, I was promoted to another organization from one CEO to the other. Okay. So this one CEO loved what I was doing so much that he said, hey, I got some guys you could really help. You want me to set you up with them? Yeah, sure. If they know what they're in for. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he promotes me to this other guy in his area who, you know, they're, they're yacht brokers. Okay. okay. So that's cool. I don't know anything about yachts. Uh, so sure, let's go visit. So I go visit and it took a while to get the, the meeting and the visit. And I, there were some red flags around that. Like we just never got the timing right, but eventually with a little persistence, I finally got the meeting and then, yeah, I got it really excited. And then I go into his facility. So Here's the deal. So a lot of interest in my approach, a lot of interest in what I do, but no pulling of the trigger. And and I know part of that is me. I totally get that. Okay. So so I tried to portray the image of what would have to happen and how we segregate a small group of people to solve a critical business problem. What I learned during my day there was they had never done anything of that type. So it, it was a very hierarchical process where very few people are making decisions and they don't they don't have the experience of including people in the change process improvement process if they actually have one or even so this was in, a this seemed like a very process. foreign process to from their perspective yeah i mean it all sounded good because certainly reducing time to sell a yacht or improving their profitability that's very interesting the way to get there of including their people to become, and it's rather than a consultant telling them what to do, that is not what I do. I, I engage the team because I get to go home. They still have to have the solution, right? Right. So, you know, so uh, it was clearly not what they were expecting and don't really know how to operate in that manner. So as much as I tried to help them see it as a real thing, they had no experience with it. So, you know, every so often I check in, hey, we'd love to have you. Well, if you would, you would have written a purchase order by now. <laughs> so clearly not, or you're not ready, or you don't know what ready looks like. So 
sometimes, so the cautionary tale is it's better to know that it doesn't work and not try it, or you're not prepared or ready for it, than to jump in and then not be able to sustain it because you're not committed to it. So I try not to just take people's money and then leave them to deal with it after I leave. I've, I've followed, this sounds self-serving, I followed a lot of consultants that do that. Mm. <laughs> They'll tell you what to do, and then you don't know what to do after they left. Well, that's not right. the point. That doesn't make any sense. You're throwing money away that way. That's I don't right. want to do that. So, that's absolutely right. you know, so clearly that wasn't going to work, you know, as much as I wanted to ride on his yacht, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> that sounds really cool. Um, you know, I don't expect if something comes of it, I'll be, I'll be shocked. Um, but, you know, and, and, and I don't want people to think it, that's that person's problem. That's me too, that my approach is not for everybody. It just isn't. And sometimes part of it is that I'm not portraying it in a way that helps them see how it could help them. Because some of this sounds ridiculous. How did you save $2 million for a team in a week? We did. We did this together. Um, but it sounds outlandish. Like a week? How does that happen? Well, people are really creative. Pe people are amazing. If you well, give them the opportunity. Pe people also, I think, um, don't want to uh, imagine that they're leaving so much yes uh that, that you know, feels on bad. the table or wasting so you know if we yeah. if we had full knowledge of the costs we cost ourselves because we could yes. make we could easily within our power make mm. some changes and right. by not making those changes if we somehow magically knew what the cost of those were <laughs> it would keep most of us up at night right it <laughs> because would, it would it's make way more than bad. what you think well, so there's a couple silly things I say once I get to know you. One of them is I'm never going to tell you how ugly your baby is, but because <laughs> that's not a, that's not a good approach. But you know, have you ever you ever seen the old Seinfeld episode where there's yes, a group that's they, a very love snuggly baby? baby. <laughs> yes, very snuggly. Yes, but there's a lot of that. So you're right. It hurts the old ego to know that we've been wasting so much money for so long. There's also kind of a predisposition against bringing somebody in from the outside to tell us what we should already know. Mm. So I try not to ever make it feel that way. Well, you're not coming in telling them anything about what they're doing. What you're doing is applying a, a model, a process that right. allows them to see what they're doing in a new right. way. Yeah, right. But and, there are times. That, that's, that's essentially, I mean, that's where you and I are right together, right? That's yeah. what the eye of power model is. It's allowing you to see the familiar territory of, of what's, going on inside here right it allows you to see that in a little different way than you otherwise would and and um we can't make any positive change if we're not aware awareness is the first thing we need right right so, so oftentimes if things are going really well which that's the goal by usually the second day going into the third day they're they're on such a roll I usually say, well, I guess you don't need me anymore. I'm going home. No, no, no. We need you where you think you're going, you know, that yeah. kind of stuff. You, you, but, you, you're, you, you're, you're holding the bike as they're going along, right? With the training <laughs> wheels sort of thing. Well, yeah. I'm just running alongside them. They, they get it. They, <laughs> they get that's, it. They that's get perfect. It. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so one question I wanted to get to, too, just uh, uh, something that I, 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 as I looked at the, the wheel of sustainability and, um, I saw you, a couple of principles that, that you emphasize in the book. You know, you said something along the lines of if everyone's in charge of a process, no one will be. And you talked about that as you were going through where, you know, you, you have a champion or somebody's given yeah. responsibility. That's the audit chair or audit person or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's one thing. And another thing you said is, you know, people are the key to improvement. So, you know, we, we tend to, especially as we go to systems, we may want to take the personalities and the people sort of out of it. But at the end of the day, it is people that run everything. So right. I said earlier, you know, one of the things about leadership is you, you have to commit tomorrow. We're going to have to be a little bit better than we are today. And that's the sort of the one non-negotiable. Right. Um, am I seeing it right as far as that sort of, yes, we're talking about systems. Yes, we're talking about uh, checklists and and uh, e efficient ways and 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 you know covering for for inefficiencies that we just were blind to in the past, but at the end of you know at the end of it, it really is a a, a people changing 
sort of a proposition. Have I got you right there, Adam? Oh, absolutely. So think about it this way. All the systems that we put in are trying to simplify the stuff so you don't have to worry about it. What, what we need your brain for and your mind and your heart and your thought is around the complex stuff. So all we're doing, the fact that I had to chase down the equipment I need for two hours, if I can remove that, now you can be the welder. <laughs> you can be the, the guy or gal solving the problem, the complex problem, using your skills and your experience and your training and your creativity and all that good stuff. And you're not wasting two hours frustrated trying to get your stuff organized. Okay. So in the end, it does come down to the people until we go AI on everything, which this is clearly not an area of my interest, but because people make decisions every single moment of every single day, they decide what they're going to do. All we're trying to do is make their decisions easier for them because sometimes they're going to have really complex stuff. And you got stuff going on in your life that's kind of affecting your work decisions as well, right? Of course, so it's a very complicated picture. Yes. And, and the, so, so the one thing, because a lot of the people listening to us, um, they might not, maybe they're on a team, maybe they manage a team, or maybe they're just sort of working by themselves. So, but we all, uh, you know, we have things we can be better at doing, and we can all perhaps uh, look in the mirror and say, what are the small things? What are the, what are the things that are, I've stopped thinking about, they're all in muscle memory that I'm doing um, that that are the opportunities to save that sort of two hours like you did with the weld team, yeah. uh, you know, and, and that's something that people could possibly do on an individual basis. Is that right? Oh yeah, absolutely. This all, you know, so in my family, we, we joke about geeking out on this stuff, right? Our kitchen is, my wife's got the kitchen and pantry organized, <laughs> you know, don't mess with the locations of that stuff. <laughs> Our clothes, are you know fall versus spring we do a rotation every six i'm so it's really geeky i've got tubs in my basement with labels on them right mm -hmm. so you can apply that to things that are beneficial to you right to make whatever it is you do i can find any tool i need for gardening or for repair because i've got them organized in a way that i know exactly where they are i never have to chase anything down my son knows if he uses a tool he knows exactly where it goes back dad don't have to tell him because he knows that there's the cutout for the hammer <laughs> by golly that's what fits right there it's nicely labeled organized he he gets it so we're making people's you can make your home life easy you can make your work life easy you can make your working space if you're working from home organized i've got everything organized in my working space my wife can tell what my upcoming two weeks are what are my three goals for the week what are the longer term tasks what are my metrics you can apply this kind of stuff in a visual way in a sustainable way to anything that's important to you so even in hobbies can you find if you if you collect coins which i do not but if you did can you find all your coins do you know when you got them where you got them if you had to sell them what are they worth you know <laughs> you so know there, so so what i'm get, gathering there then adam is is we may or may not pay attention we might we may or may not naturally be an organized thinker we might may or, we we may or may not take the time to um uh, create these sort of systems naturally if we do right. okay you're you're what you just said is sort of preaching to the choir those right. who don't naturally do that that's yeah. where they are probably paying a higher price than they realize because their focus is somewhere else right they're on they're on talking to that person and being a supportive person and being uh right. you know contributing to the relationships in their life or right. it might be on some other priority uh creative or or uh productive priority um and so we get sort of um, uh, we might poo poo that, oh, you know, okay, that's for anal retentive people will do it that way. Not me. Right, right. Um, uh, you know, everything's exactly where I want it, you know, if, because I put it there and no one else can come and find a darn thing. And neither can you, if you're honest with yourself, <laughs> truth. Right. Told, of course, of course. Anything. That's right. That's um, right. so, so the, the question starts to come, uh, to, to my mind is, 
if you're working with a team, you're going to have a spectrum of people along what the the area that we were just talking about. Where some are naturally going to take to this sort of organized. Yes. Approach. Others, this is going to be a huge, huge stretch for them. Right. And and so I guess this is where that audit and that accountability comes into play. Where you know you you some people really need other people's help to actually do this at all. Possibly. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Now, now remember, one of the elements is a clear benefit. So we only are designing something that will be beneficial to the people that designed it or the people that will use it. Okay. So, so even those disorganized people have helped design it in a way that they go, hey, you know what? This actually helps me. Okay. Maybe so I don't in other like words, all at least elements part of them of has admitted that this is better. Because yeah, they were part of the solution. Yeah. Yeah. So... Okay. I mean, but you're right. There's a broad spectrum of, of this. So think about the home thing. Yeah, so I, I make fun of myself for doing these kinds of things. What's the real benefit of having an organized kitchen, organized toolbox, organized this or that? It allows me to have more time to do the fun stuff because I'm not wasting time on the hard stuff, which if you think about it, if I love being around family, it gives me more time to be around family. If I love to go fishing, it gives me more time to go fishing. If I like to travel, it gives me more time to do that. So a small investment in a behavior or a habit gives you more time to do the things you actually love to do. So what's wrong with that? That's a nice little benefit. Yeah, no matter who you are. No matter who, uh, and and if you just prefer to sit and watch television, then you've got more time to sit and watch television, <laughs> right? So if you like yeah. that, by golly, we can help you there too. <laughs> sit there in front of the TV with your label maker. Oh yeah, <laughs> making oh, labels. Yeah. Oh my goodness, yeah. If that's what you're into, there you, you do. Go. I do. By the way, I do have a label maker. No one, <laughs> no, no one should be shocked by that. And I, no, can I would you, think so. And I, it's within arm's reach. I, it's right in the drawer, right next to me, right here. <laughs> I don't have to demonstrate that for you. Though. There you go. Yeah. Was well, there anything else that I didn't ask you that that um, you think might pertain to the theme of our discussion today, Adam? Well, I mean, you know, here's the thing. I could talk about this all day and your listeners don't have all day, <laughs> right? So clearly, you know, what I would say is this whole system is nothing new. It's just my construct that was trying to solve a problem for me and the teams that I was helping. The idea being that, hey, they worked so hard to solve a problem. How do I help it stay solved? So this, what's nice about the Wheel of Sustainability from my viewpoint is it's it's so simple even adam can do it so <laughs> it's teachable it's trainable we we actually do it every single time you know we learn it's not perfect uh is there something missing probably do you lose anything by not doing one of the spokes yeah a little bit but at least you tried so i always say to my teams hey the goal is you've uh, tried to apply every one of those elements to the changes you've made. If you've at least tried it, then we're way better off than if you hadn't tried it. So okay. it's simple. I don't, every element is designed to be simple. Nothing needs high skill, computer skills, AI skills. You just gotta be able to write big. <laughs> you have to be willing to draw ugly pictures sure. and, and be willing to talk to people. You That's know, right. and yeah. Your company is process improvement partners, not process perfection partners. That is correct. Yes. So one of our other sayings is, but ugly by Friday. But ugly by Friday. But ugly by Friday, which means your solution doesn't have to be pretty. It just has to help people. So don't worry about it looking perfect. Worry about, is it helping people? We'll, we'll make it pretty later. So we say, but ugly by Friday. And we say silly terms like that because people remember that. And I didn't make that up. It was said to me about 15 years ago. And I said, that's cool. I'm stealing that one. I'm keeping but that. ugly by keep Friday. It. Right out of Pensacola, Florida. So <laughs> shout out to them. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, Adam, I got to thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule and, and being yeah. with us today here at the iPower community. I so much appreciate you. And uh, you know, I respect what you do. I know uh, the kind of value you bring to, to you know, lots of uh, teams of various ki kinds and uh, uh, very much respect the model that you created. And uh, 
Um, I love the chance to, to, to sort of chop it up with a kindred spirit like we've been able to do today. So I very much appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. I thank you for letting me be your guest on the Eye of Power podcast. Adam talked about a few things that I thought were uh, really valuable to the Eye of Power uh, community. Uh, one of the things was uh, in terms of the the idea of the kinds of changes we might we might want to make may not be all that dramatic or they might be hard to sort of see in a physical form. And he had a really good idea of, of how we can make that happen just by sort of translating into words and putting it in a place you can see, whether it's a checklist or a reminder, some sort of thing that says, did I do that thing I agreed to? Yes or no. And sort of we can create metrics for ourselves and sustain that. So uh, maybe in a journal, we use journals a lot in the, in, in working in the iPower community. Uh, we keep track so we can see where we st- where we're on track, where we got a little bit off track and be able to make those changes. And so when we do that as a team, we're not doing it by ourselves. We're taking, we're, we're keeping those records and then sharing them with our guide. Um, now we've got a discussion, a thought partner where we can come up with solutions and come up with ways um, that, that we can at least do that sustainable thing that we know we can do if we just remember. And we just got to do it long enough to sustain it. So I appreciate those parts of the discussion that we had today. Um, uh, um, the other thing was the types of people that we might either be ourselves or encounter. Um, he was pointing to the idea of the the team of welders, right? And, you know, the, the grumbling and the, you know, we don't have to do it this way. You know, we're, it's, this way is fine. And uh, that tends to be something that a lot of people have that attitude. You probably know people like that yourself. And the idea there is that we tend, we, for the purposes of understanding, we have a tendency to want to reduce. So that's called reductionism, right? We want to reduce complicated things down to bite-sized form. And hey, we just spent a bunch of time talking about how that can be a good thing. We we intentionally do that, but we can't keep in uh, we can't lose track of the of the reality that things are not so simple. And so when we poo-poo and we say, look, I know everything there is to know here. There's no room to improve here. A uh, little bit of humility maybe could be in store. That's a lot of hubris to imagine that you know everything there is to know is not going to comport with reality uh, almost all the time. So that's something I think we can all learn from. In Adam's talk, I, I was also thinking in terms of you know, how he pointed to how people are willing to, sometimes willing to change, some, sometimes not, kind of already sort of wired to prefer the, the how we've been doing it, prefer the familiar, and that it becomes uh, a function of leadership to impose uh, that, that new standard, or at least that expectation that no, status quo has got to go. And that's something that I find myself talking about a lot with people. Um, and we can apply that in our own lives too, where uh, you are the one who decides what acceptable is, what, you know, what is, what is your level of, you know, income or your, your lifestyle. Um, you're the one who says what I have is fine. I need more. Um, what, how much more do I actually need? How much is too much? How much is too little? These are variables, depends on the other values we have, of course. And whether it's a material thing or a spiritual thing, um, we're the arbiters to say, okay, this is what I think I uh, can, this is no longer a tension for me at this level. And so, uh, but that's a variable and we get to choose that. Part of our agency, part of our power is to actually look at what that is, make sure we're not sort of deluded. Is Are we taking a limitation based on something that, is not true, but we just accepted because of an experience or because somebody said this, or we don't know what we don't know. Um, so I take that as a, as an invite to stay in the question, to, re- to remain uh, open and, and wanting to learn. So these are the lessons I took. I'd be interested to hear uh, as you listen to that conversation, what you took and uh, please do 
share that with us so we can all uh, get the most that we possibly can out of this and every other Eye of Power podcast episode. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. This has been the Eye of Power podcast with Tom Dardick. I'd like to thank you for listening. I'd also like to thank my brother, Scott Dardick, for the music and his music production. If you'd like to reach me, simply email tom at dardickcommunications.com.